All right, so for those of you just tuning in, we're about to spectate a 1v1 on the map Salt Marsh between my viewers as part of my weekly Twitch TV live streams. If you want to get in on this, you can find my live stream schedule by going to my Twitch page and scrolling underneath the video player there. I do update that about every few days. And if you follow me on Facebook and Twitter, you will get updates. The focus of today's video is going to be a 1v1 civilization matchup analysis of the Huns versus the Saracens. Uh, before this game crashed, I decided that I would uh, have these players random civilization and that I was going to talk about how these two civilizations pair up against each other, their strengths and weaknesses, differences in the tech tree, and how those things should influence your strategy choices. Definitely recommend that you guys check out the previous episodes in this series, uh, where I cover the Goths versus the Mayans, uh, perhaps the most lopsided civilization matchup in Age of Empires 2, and then I did the Britons versus Goths, perhaps the most misplayed one. All right, without further ado, let's start this game. Windscreen Wipers disconnects. We are uninstalling Age of Empires 2. <laughs> oh, man. Welcome to stream Parchment Squirrel, who is Chromecasting this live stream right now. I need a Chromecast. All right, without further ado, let's jump into the game and start by introducing the players. On the bottom side of the map, we have Salty Seven Hands, a.k.a. Cleanage, playing as the Red Huns. And on the top side of the map, we have Windscreen Wipers playing as the Blue Saracens. We are, of course, playing on the map Salt Marsh in honor of one of my viewers, Soldier. This is his favorite map. And honestly, Salt Marsh in the Steam DLCs is actually a fairly decent map compared to you know, what it used to be like in the classic Age of Empires 2 CD version, where it was probably the most imbalanced map in the game, uh, at le or most lopsided, because sometimes one player would have access to you know, an abundant source of fish, and then one player would have none, and that could really snowball a game out of control, so. All right. At the start of the game, we see that uh, Salty Seven Hands actually did have a little bit of trouble finding his initial turkeys, but he should be fine. Uh, the nice thing about the, the DLC version of Salt Marsh is that actually you don't really need to dock, so we don't really need to worry that much about the any sort of map discrepancies. So we're going to start a little bit by talking about the Huns. The Huns, of course, are a cavalry civilization, and we can briefly take a look at our bonuses here. Not having to build houses, but starting with 100 less wood is actually quite nice. Cavalry archers cost less. Trebuchet is more accurate. Tarkin is an anti-building -caval uh, anti cavalry unit. Marauders can create targets at the stable. Atheism irrelevant. Stables work 20% faster. What does this mean? The Huns, like I just said, they are a cavalry civilization. They have very strong mounted units and a very powerful early game. Why is that? Well, first off, one of the most iconic strategies as the Huns is going to be the Huns' Scout Rush. And this is, of course, because their stables work 20% faster, allowing them to mass up a small group of scouts in the early game and then do some raiding on your opponent's villagers, try and pick some of them off. Uh, that's something that the Huns are really good with. Huns also have a very strong early game because of the fact that they don't have to build houses. It's actually very easy for you to recoup that uh, that loss of 100 wood, and then you end up saving a very significant amount of wood over the entire course of a game by not having to build houses. In the Castle Age, the Huns, of course, can go for a Night Rush, which is buffed by their 20% faster working stables, and then they also have a discounted Cavalry Archer Rush. The Huns are actually historically one of the few civilizations in Age of Empires 2 that is capable of going for a competitive fast castle age into cavalry archers, whereas other civilizations, cavalry archers are just too expensive for them to be good. And for the Huns, it's oftentimes overbearing. Still though, in the DLCs, the Huns have been nerfed a little bit, particularly with their cavalry archer bonus, and cavalry archer cost has gone down overall, so other civilizations perhaps it is a more viable strategy. <laughs> Pete says, but you could make docks everywhere. That's true, that's true. So anyway, the Huns, They've got the early game on their side, and in the later stages of the game, the Huns are characterized, like I said, by their powerful cavalry units. When you think Huns, you think mounted units. They have heavy cavalry archers, they have paladins, this poor lure is dangerous without Loom, he's very far away, so... All eyes in this little villager right here, will she be able to make it back? The the Huns, it's like generally, they can only really make paladins, heavy cavalry archers, uh, siege rams, and then trash units, so units that don't cost gold. Oh, he will be able to make it. Nicely done, Mr. Seven Hands. So, units that don't cost gold, so this is going to be the Halberdier, Hussar, and Elite Skirmisher. Uh, but beyond that, they really don't get that many units. Uh, how do we know what units are good for a civilization? We just see you know, whether or not they have full upgrades for them, or any sort of civilization-specific bonuses, and we can tell that the Huns are a cavalry-oriented civilization. 
What does this mean for them in the context of this matchup? Well, first, in order to answer that question, we must check out the Saracens really briefly. So, the Saracens are a camel and naval civilization. Market trade only costing 5% means you can exchange resources of the market really nicely. Markets cost 75 less wood. That is a change that was added in the DLCs and Steam. Transport ships is relevant here. Galleys. I mean, these are nice bonuses, but they're relevant in the on this land map. Cavalry Archers plus 3 attack versus buildings is one of my favorite bonuses, but it's not that great. Um... Their Mamluk is like a, a camel with a ranged attack that still deals melee damage. It's very strong. It's very expensive. Uh, Madraza, killed monks, returned 33% of their gold cost. That's really cute. I've never really seen it actually be useful, but it's cute. Zealotry, camels and Mamluks plus 30 hit points. And foot archers plus one attack versus buildings. There's a team bonus. I'm going to start on a strange note here. We're going to talk a little bit about the Saracen's team bonus. Most people think this bonus is completely useless. That's not actually quite the case. Archer units having foot archers having plus one attack versus buildings seems like it's a really garbage bonus. And it is some of the time, but when you're going for a feudal age like Archer Rush, having plus one attack versus buildings allows you to pick off enemy palisade walls and like you know, for example like this incredibly quickly, as well as you know, house foundations. And this allows the Saracens to actually apply a substantial amount of early game pressure with an archer rush if they so desire. But when we looked at the Saracens bonuses, we can clearly see that their strengths lie in the later stages of the game. They don't really have any significant early game economy bonus, or really anything that would lend them to being a very strong early game rushing civilization. They do get the discounted market, which is really nice, and the better market exchange rate, but that will only come into play in the, the feudal age, the absolute earliest, if not significantly later on in the game. Well, this is actually a really good play, by the way, by Salty Seven Hands, seeing that this scout is right here, moving his militia a little off to the right, that way he will not be seen, but Windscreen Wipers does see the flag on top of that barrack, so he does know the Drush is definitely coming his way. We also saw uh, 10 gold being mined here by Salty Seven Hands. We might actually see a uh, some men-at-arms, I'm not exactly sure. He ended up building the mining camp. Oftentimes when we go for three militia Drush, we usually just mine the 10 gold and then not build the mining camp. Uh, you know, just long distance drop it off to make the three militia because you know, they have 50 gold left over after Loom and then you know, 60 for three militia. So his goal here is to group up with his scout, not really kill any villagers necessarily, but just force them to fight back, cause a lot of economic damage uh, because of that idle time. Now, the Saracens of Civilization, they do get access to you know, the classic Saracen Monk Rush. By the way, thank you so much, TK the PK, for your 10 month resub. Really appreciate it. Helps out a lot. Uh, so they do have like, a very strong Monk Rush, uh, you know partly in fact due to their uh, better market exchange rate bonus it's just such a really nice bonus in the later stages of the game it's just difficult to get value out of that early on um and the cheaper market is nice too really what makes the saracens scary uh are not their cavalry archers because the plus three attack bonus versus buildings at that point in the game it's a little bit less relevant but it's a little kind of cute what makes them scary is their mamluk unique unit which costs a whopping 85 gold a piece so if you want a late game monster it's going to be that he does need to focus fire down this militia. Will he be able to get it down in time? The answer is probably yes. So the Saracens are kind of a late game powerhouse civilization. They don't really have that much in the realm of early game. This used to be even worse before they uh, got some buffs in the Steam DLC. So it's a little bit better now. Uh, it's just that primarily their strengths lie in the late game when the Mamluks come out. And remember, the Mamluks are an anti-cavalry unit. They're a camel unit. And the Huns as a civilization are actually... They almost exclusively have good cavalry units. They have good cavalry units and trash units. If we talk a little bit about trash units versus Mamluks, the answer is they match up absurdly poorly. Mamluks are like a hard counter to all trash units. They cut through, they eat through an army of Asars like a knife cuts through butter. And they just destroy elite skirmishers, which just don't do enough damage to the Mamluks, and then they just mow down the Halberdiers, which don't have enough armor uh, to resist them. Mamluks deal melee damage, not ranged damage, and they have a very high attack stat. Castle Age Mamluks, not so great. Imperial Age Elite Mamluks, they're expensive, but once you're able to get all the upgrades, and good lord, you need a lot of upgrades and a lot of gold, they're absurd. In a 1v1, though, they're a little bit less absurd, because you're not going to have access to, like, a stable trade line between your allies, thus making the gold cost, you know, a significantly higher risk. Uh, thank you so much, Gudiger, for the 100 bits. Really appreciate it. it. says, if two trainers' eyes meet, they have to battle. <laughs> thank you, Gudiger. I have to say, I'm a huge fan of shorts because they're comfy and easy to wear. Next year, when I, uh, if I actually whip out the Team Rocket Grunt costume again like I did this year, I need to find a lift key that I can drop when people talk to me. Will he be able to get this militia? He just needs to... Oh my god. No! 
Villager escapes, only need to get hit one more time with that Militia Maze. And meanwhile, the Men-at-Arms are coming in to uh, Salty Seven Hands' economy. And it's actually going to interrupt both of the, the Archer Range and the Blacksmith, so 73%, 85%. A little bit devastating for Salty Seven Hands here. He did some damage with his Drush, but he is getting uh, Men-at-Arms rushed by his opponent right now. And this kind of boils down to a point that I'm going to make in a lot of my Civilization matchup videos, which is... Oftentimes, one Civ will have slightly stronger late game than the other, and one Civ will have slightly stronger early game. Sometimes they'll both end up being around the same early game strength, and there still are going to be differences in how you want to play that matchup based off your tech tree and what units you want to make. But basically, if your opponent has better late game than you do, you want to play more aggressive. Waymender, this is a 1v1 Salt Marsh. Uh, high rate of game. These players are very good. They're like 2k. Um... So if your civilization has weaker late game, you want to play aggressive early. You want to play to your civilization's strengths. And when you're the Huns, generally you want to be the aggressor. Sure, late game paladins are nice, but they're very expensive in a 1v1. And the game might not get to that point, And then your bonuses start to become significantly less helpful. If you are the Saracens, your goal is kind of just to survive. Because you're, you already naturally have a better late game. And if you're able to field out a large army of you know, elite Mamluks, then you should just be able to mow down the Huns' army. There's actually almost nothing the Huns can really do against elite Mamluks. It's just that when we compare this to the Mayans versus Goths matchup, getting out elite Mamluks is so much slower than Huskarls. It is unbelievable. So this is actually a more different dynamic than one would expect, even though it sounds similar. Because elite Mamluks, it's, a, it's an Imperial Age thing, and it's a post-Imperial Age thing. Whereas Huskarls can start beating down on the Mayans as early as the Castle Age if you let them, so... Salty Seven Hands, he's not in a huge rush, but he does want to do a little bit of rushing. Thank you so much, Sergio Tor 9 for the sub. Thank you so much for taking the time to support the channel. Helps a lot. For those of you who have subscribed to my channel with Twitch Prime, don't forget that it does not manually renew, so you will have to... Uh, it does not automatically renew, so you will have to uh, manu You have to manually do it yourself. English is hard. <laughs> It looks like, uh, does he have fletching? Salty Seven Hands does not have fletching, but Windscreen Wipers does. So he's going to have to pull back here only on... Okay, so he just did the second archer range. Uh, great job on Windscreen Wipers part to mix in some skirmishers initially with his army, knowing that his opponent initially wanted to go for archers, and the person here with the most skirmishers will probably come out on top. There is the home field advantage, though, for Salty Seven Hands. He does have his opponent outnumbered, but he's concerned about the range advantage from fletching. When it comes to these range units versus range units engagements, you really want to make sure that you have... Fletching. That way you can get the first shot off. And no matter how well Salty Seven Hands can micro, even though this seems really close, he's going to be taking a lot of free damage before he can engage, and he kind of has to make up his mind. Look at all this free damage he's taking. Early on, this can be an absolute disaster. Will he engage? He's trying to cut off this army. Stable coming down, so Salty Seven Hands is going to go even more aggressive here. The question is, does he need to, or should he be going straight to the Castle Age? And in order to answer that question, we're going to have to see what Windscreen Wipers is up to. Of course, Salty Seven Hands has no idea what windscreen wipers is up to. <laughs> oh my. Uh, legit, uh, or Let's Get Bizet asks, are you married? No. Not currently. Uh, welcome, player4595. Welcome to the stream, and hello, uh, Nizen. I'm actually 22 years old now. Uh, I wasn't when I made the username like five years ago, but yeah, I am actually 22 now, so. No fletching, by the way. Uh, for red, and I feel like you want the blacksmith before the, the scouts here, but the scouts are really, really good versus blue's army, as these are, you know, ranged units, and then the scout has, uh, you know, nice, solid two pierce armor. This outpost is particularly interesting. Um, it doesn't really give him that much information, but what it does say, what it does say is it reveals to windscreen wipers every single time uh, Salty Seven Hands wants to leave his own base. Thank you so much, Nizen, for the two-month reef sub. Two months already, seems like it's only been 31 days. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nizen. Really appreciate it. Indeed, crazy guy. But believe it or not, I sounded like this since I was like, what, 16 years old or something like that? It's weird. Usual ELO range for high rated games is like 1750, 1800 plus, but these guys are like 1950, 2k. Thank you as well, player4595, for the sub. This is a very, very awkward situation for Seven Hands, our Red Huns player, and this is going to be devastating for him. As his army is boxed in this corner, he cannot escape, and he's going to lose every single military unit, giving Windscreen Wiper is almost an insurmountable early game military advantage. But, 
then Salty Seven Hands will still be fine. I do think, though, this is his signal to retreat. There's absolutely no way he can apply any offensive pressure here. He does have Fletching and Padded Archer armor, so goddamn, he is committing to this Feudal Age fight. Trying to harass this wood line over over the trees, and this will do quite a bit of economic damage to his opponent, but he has to be careful not to lose his army again. He's just trying to keep the fight in his opponent's base, but I don't know if I would have even... I don't know, I would pull out, basically, at this point. Uh, he could kill that one villager, though. So, one HP. These archers will be caught with their pants down. Windscreen wipers picking them off one by one. This villager does escape with one HP. Thank you so much, Urban Cohort, for the five-month resub. He said, I wish I had something deep to say about this, but all I have is Cthulhu. Thank you so much for supporting the channel, guys. Really appreciate it. Uh, lots of good stuff on the way. It's a huge army for blue. Red desperately trying to apply some pressure. I do like the choice to mix in a couple of these scouts. Uh, he actually got scale barding armor to make sure that they resist those mass ranged units even better, and he's just harassing these deer hunters. Of course, Windscreen Wipers is doing this because he really wants to get to the Castle Age, and uh, one quick way to do that is just you know snag your deer. He, he could actually advance the Castle Age, and he is going to start doing that now. I think that Red, though, is going to be nowhere near that, considering how much he's invested into his army, and now he is in deep trouble. What will probably happen in this video is we will not get to see the Huns versus Saracens playing out too much as they would, as this is more of a Compared to other Civilization matchups, this one is an extremely late game one. The Saracens are a little bit weaker early, and they are stronger later, but they're only stronger absurdly later. So, it would, we would really only see that coming into play in a team game, where this matchup is significantly more problematic if you happen to be dealing with like a Saracens pocket near the Huns pocket. That can be quite annoying to deal with. How do you deal with that? Um, heavy cavalry archers are acceptable. You know, you still kind of have to make... Basically, you just stay away from the Mamluks, ideally. Hopefully, you either kill them before that, or you can enlist the help of your teammates, and then try and um, engage elsewhere with your paladins and your heavy cavalry archers, and just try not to take that fight directly, and try and inch in forward with some halberdiers. Uh, you're going to end up losing a lot of them, but sacrifices must be made. Good defense here by Red, even though he's significantly outnumbered. He, he wants to make archers, even though archers are not that great versus the mixed skirmisher archer uh, comp. He wants to make archers anyway, though, because he really wants to stockpile some food to get to the Castle Age. And he's getting there. He's getting there. He won't be that far behind. He just needs to make sure that he collects enough gold for this. And he's actually set up his base immaculately well so that he will not lose this early on. So this game will continue. Well played here by Red. And, of course, extremely well played on Blue's part for boxing in that army up here like he did early on. And just coming out on top in the early game despite a significant amount of early pressure. Uh, Leo He123 asks, is there any way to improve your gameplay in Black Forest? Yes, there is, and you're in the right place, my friend. Uh, definitely recommend that you check out my Black Forest games on my YouTube channel. They're ones, you know, I've got like Black Forest tips and tricks, uh, where I talk quite a bit about ways to improve your game in Black Forest. But the most important thing that you can do to improve your game overall in Age of Empires 2 is just make sure your town center is always working, creating villagers, researching attack, or advancing the next age. Running a stonewall off that other side. He should not be engaging here, but he does want to delay that early game forward siege workshop. So really well played on Red. He's behind, but playing quite nicely. He just needs to get to the castle age. And he's on his way there. He's stalling for time. And I'm when I said he didn't want him to engage, I do think it was absolutely fantastic for him to pick up that villager as long as he ran when he did to not lose the rest of these scouts. This forward siege workshop was going to apply a lot of pressure to the front half of Red's base. Siege weapons are very slow, and if you want to actually apply the killing blow to your opponent, get through these watchtowers, uh, get through this town center, you're going to need a mangonel or a battering ram. If you build it in your own base, it's going to take way too long for it to actually get there, and by that time, your window of opportunity will be long gone. Also really clever of Red to leave his forge bushes left in a way that there's actually creates like a little bit of makeshift wall. But here come the Saracen team bonus in action. Tearing right through those palisade walls. What was I talking about earlier? These farmers are going to take a lot of damage. Will Red be able to survive until he gets to the Castle Age? The answer is maybe. Like, he's... he needs a What he needs right now is a Mangonel above all else. And actually, it looks like his economy is a little bit imbalanced. And this is something that happens, I think, to the best of us. Blue going to take some free damage underneath his town center. But right now, what we see here is a very tricky concept in Age of Empires 2. If we compare economy balances, Blue just has it quite a bit... Okay, no, his is really... A little off, too. <laughs> he has 900 gold. Thankfully, though, Red has a market, so he's going to buy his way to a siege workshop. Well played. All he needs is one mangonel, and if he gets a good mangonel shot, he's back in the game, and he's winning. Uh, what happened here is that Red made a lot of farms, because he needed to get to the castle, Prano. 
And you know what he did? He, uh, after he clicked up to the Castle Age, you should have reassigned his villagers, uh, like, really heavy on wood and gold, uh, knowing that he, the secret to success here is going to be Mangadel, maybe a couple of knights, and he didn't exactly do that, but it's really easy for us to, to say that in retrospect, but during the game, he's got so much that he has to do. Bloodlines, plus one attack, plus one defense for these knights, oh god, but the Siege Workshop is up, and a forward monastery to boot! Now we're in for an interesting game. Another monastery to boot. Windscreen Wipers has 900 gold in the bank because he's seeing monks. He's feeling the wool low. Wants to convert some of those enemy mangonels. Is that what he's going to do? Is he going to snag that redemption upgrade? Only time will tell. Only time will tell. 65 population to about 83. So pretty large lead for Windscreen Wipers. Here come the monks. He's got three queued up over here. These knights, he's going to need a lot of them. Critical mass before he can actually engage on these crossbows and skirms. He's going to need a mangonel, but he hasn't actually been able to produce one yet. Hmm, is he even producing one right now? He's not, because he can't afford one because he doesn't have enough gold. And here comes the forward army. <laughs> Look at this blacksmith disintegrating to that uh, extra archer attack. It's kind of nice. It's a, mid it's a mini obsidian arrows for free. Meanwhile, though, Red doing what he should be doing when you're playing from behind. The Great Equalizer is raiding, my friends. This is tricky, though, to know when you're actually able to do this, because you need to make sure that you don't pull off enough of your military that you actually just die. But he is picking off quite a few exterior villagers from blue to try and even out the uh, economy discrepancy. Will this Mangonel come out in time? Here come some monks. Does he have redemption to convert this Mangonel? We'll have to see. This could be GG. Red should not engage yet. He should engage with that Mangonel. Oh, but he is actually going to force these back. Four mangonels here for Blue. Blue kind of all in on this, but at the same time, he's building up his own economy at the back. Excellent mangonel shot. Looks like these knights are going to get converted. He will delete them both. Well played, Red. <laughs> God, Red is behind, and he's behind because his army got pinned early game, but good lord is he adapting this nicely. Trying to repair the mangonel, but he does not get it. Both mangonels trading. Two for one, great trade here for Red, but he is taking so much damage, and there's still a massive army here for Blue. By having to focus down those mangonels, he's not able to deal with these crossmen, with these skirmishers, and Red in so much trouble. That's a really awkward wall up. Blue has a second town center, not neglecting his economy at home, and 34 minutes in the game, the Saracens take advantage of their econ economic bonus by building a market. This goes to show, guys, you don't really need... <laughs> You don't need an eco bonus to win the early game if you play really well, so, you know, good job, Blue. MLZK, welcome to the stream. Oh my god, what a devastating push from Blue. This knight will not get deleted in time at the end of its conversion. Skirmisher's moving up. This is a really excellent timing attack from Blue. Once you get to the Castle Age, uh, not only do archers not slow down your Castle Age time that much, he probably should have clicked on a crossbowman there, that way he could have actually killed it and reduce some damage from that army overall. Um, but also archers, you can get the crossman upgrade for them in the castle age, uh, and then the bodkin arrow upgrade for like a huge power spike. Oh god, this is so dicey for red, but he might be able to claw his way back into the game if he can get some good, uh, good mangonel shots. It's all gonna come down to good micro. He is keeping his town center working all the time, so good on him, and he's gonna trade again, but even trades aren't good enough. He needs god trades. He needs good trades. He needs to send these villagers back to work. He is doing a really good job holding the line here, I have to say. He's holding on, but... This main gold being denied might honestly be the nail in the coffin, but it doesn't have to be. There's a gold mine right here, and he knows this if he just reassigns some of those villagers at the back. But he's not aware that those idle villagers are there, because right now he's really focused on defending, which is something that is going to take all of his attention away. And right now, three forward monasteries from Windscreen Wipers. He's got the market as well, so he's just able to pour the gold into this. Honestly, Red is doing a really good job holding the line here. And in fact, if this is an extra town center, then he might be able to claw his way back in. Again, like I said, it's just going to take some excellent micro. Good trades. Will he... Oh, no. God, if he could kill that Mangonel and not lose his, then he can he can maybe even win this game. But trading one for one's not good enough. He needs to trade two for one. Blue showing us the outposts are the secret to success. Apparently, that's how you win this matchup. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, is with vision, map control. Drop some forward outposts. Oh, wow, he even has Sanctity for the monks, which I think is really great here against all these ranged units. Red's doing a really good job holding the line. It, it, he's just like one really good Naganel shot from winning. If he, especially if he can pick off this knight, because this knight's going to be really bad charging at that Manganel. 
I think going for some light cavalry here would actually be really good. If you re oh no, zero for one trade. <laughs> He's gonna call GG. Like I said, this entire matchup depends at this point in the game on good trades. Can he at least kill that Manganel before the game ends? One or denied. Yeah, I feel like light cavalry would have been good here, but really what uh, what lost him the game was that you know he lost his, his forward gold, and the game kind of snowballed out of Red's control after he lost this initial army. You know, he's playing like super duper aggressive here. I think that they both played really well, and this was actually a very entertaining game to watch, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, Red did an excellent uh, job uh, defending, and Blue did such a good job defending earlier, and then applying some of his own pressure later. Yeah, okay, yeah, he did recognize that by putting the mining camp down. Uh, yeah, just it was just going to take some really solid Manganel shots uh, to bring him back in the game, and he was just slowly falling behind economically, and we're seeing 103 population compared to 75. Still, this game was a lot closer than we give it credit for, and you know, really cool to see the Sanctity upgrade coming out, and you know, triple forward monasteries. This is a really awesome, entertaining uh, matchup to watch, and of course, the Saracens do have stronger monks, so that's always something that is on the table, and... You know, the Mamluk part of the Civ matchup never really came into play, but more often than not, at least for you guys, if you're playing on, you know, Black Forest or Arena or any sort of team game on Arabia, Mamluks are going to be something that you have to watch out for, so. Really, really well played. All right, let's go check out the achievements, shall we? Hope you guys enjoyed watching this one. Please do let me know, and if you did, I'd appreciate it if you take the time to leave a thumbs up. It helps support the channel as well as a comment, and maybe even share it around on various places. Thank you so much. We can tell by the KD again. This match was a bit closer than it seemed. Uh, I do like that the Saracens team bonus, or the archers have like plus one attack versus building, actually came into play here. So we basically got to see everything except the the super late game. And I think this matchup is a lot more even now in Forgotten Empires, and that overall the devs have done an absolutely excellent job at smoothing out the Civ matchups a bit. If we could just maybe do something about the mines versus Goss just a little bit. <laughs> but hey, at least two handed swordsmen have uh, an extra one attack. Yeah, it's, 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 it's something. It's something. Yeah, even uh, Red even collected more food this game and more stone. Yeah, Defensive Castle would have also been something that could have saved him. Uh, Light Cavalry, since he didn't have any access to gold, Light Cavalry actually did kind of tear right through that army, and Blue didn't have access to camels yet, so that could have been pretty solid. Yeah, second game coming up after this. Um, yeah, it's gonna be a fun one. Again, this game was much closer than it seems. 75 to 66 villager high. Red did a really good job keeping up with his villager count, and this is because he knows the secret to success is keeping your town center always working. Let me know if my commentary was helpful to you in some way. Really appreciate the feedback. And I also appreciate those of you who take the time to give a watch and try and support the content that I do for other games. This does help out a lot with the longevity of the channel. So thank you so much for taking the time to give it a chance. You have no idea when any of those other games are, but you still would like to support the channel. I have tutorial videos for almost all of the games that I do play regularly in addition to Age of Empires 2. So you can find those tutorials on my YouTube page. And we're going to take a brief break now. Thank you so much for watching. The next game will start in approximately 10 minutes or so, and then I'm going to take about a two-minute break. We're going to start the drawing for that, and I'm really looking forward to it. Patch 4.8. By the time you watch this video, we'll probably already be public, and it looks like Age of Empires 2 HD Edition is finally on a good path and getting better. Can't wait to see the future. Can't wait to you know, bring you guys with me, and I'll be right back. Thank you for watching so far. GG, well played. Salty Seven Hands and Windscreen Wipers. Be right back. Tristan says, oh yeah, your commentary has helped a lot to improve my strategy. Really glad to hear that. 